All right, good morning. How are you today? Everything all right? So you received my email. I hope uh, this is something that encourages you a little bit. Is there anything complicated in terms of mathematics? Greater or equal to 70 than this? Well, this is simple arithmetic. So uh, if you perform well in the final exam, your bad performance in the midterm exam can be offset. So it is all up to you from now on. And as I indicated, there will be no bonus in the final exam. There will be most probably four shorter answer questions. So you will be given like two questions on one side of the page and two questions on the other side. So each uh, from uh, being 25 points. And uh, there will be more specific. And as I said, questions that will not necessitate long writing. So if you attend classes starting today till the end of the semester and make your readings, this is essential, then there should not be any difficulty for you to recover from your losses, the damage control of uh, midterm exams. So um, I hope this has given, provided some sort of an impetus for you to do a better job. I don't know why you perform so bad. As I said, it was the worst ever performance in my 13-year career at Pilkent. Well, part of the blame can go to me. Well, I don't know. And, but I believe you should definitely um, think about where you've done wrong, right? So these are the questions. Actually, the questions that I asked over the last three years, almost exact same questions. And as I indicated in my email, when I was a student, we were doing a very uh, good investigative job as to what kind of questions or which questions profess professors asked in the previous year. So if you had just a very, very uh, brief research, you could have had access to my previous exam questions. And by the way, I said almost every single one of them in the class that this is a very good midterm exam question. Here is the question and here is the answer. And the answer were not only in podcasts here, but also in the PowerPoint. So um, I think much of the blame must go to you. So just think about it. Uh, try to uh, make this analysis where you have done wrong, where, where things have gone wrong. And if it is in your interest to have a good grade, not only a passing grade, but a high grade, a higher grade than you expect, well, of course, uh, one of the easiest instructors here at Billiken from whom you can get high, very high grades, all right? So I have no problem by, uh, with giving students A's, A minuses, B plus, whatever. So I don't count as to how many I should give or not. It is all up to you. If you show your willingness, your enthusiasm, enthusiasm to learn, I'll do more than your uh, uh, effort. All right. Um, you must have followed the uh, most recent developments in the world. The most important one, uh, something that you know, start putting a smile on our faces is these leaks or the WikiLeaks. There is no single individual on the surface of the earth who doesn't speak about WikiLeaks. Wherever you go, well, this is the subject matter. And I, one of the funniest jokes that I heard, uh, I think that was last week uh, during one of the TV talk shows or just one of the um, news broadcasts that, well, in the past, diplomats used to talk to the journalists on the condition of uh, being on, off the record. Now the journalists are going to talk to the diplomats on the condition of being off the record. So, well, uh, especially people like us, academics, politicians, deputies, uh, intellectuals who are from time to time invited to uh, receptions, protocols, dinner tables, and things like that, discussions. Of course, people will be <laughs> this time more careful. Well, I used to be, because at least I knew uh, that the guy who was talking to me was a diplomat, and his job was, quote unquote, uh, spying. So you have to pay attention to what you're saying, because whatever you say will be recorded, maybe not in tape recorder, but just you know, some notes will be taken and will be reported. So therefore, this is something that actually revealed many of the information, uh, which would not be otherwise available for at least next 20, 30, 50 years. As I remember, uh, the last time I mentioned this, 
that was about when I made this uh, short brief about uh, comments about your exam performance and I said international relations is such a field that we deal with indeed uncertainty and we try to make some sort of a science out of it and that uh, in the absence of uh, correct information or uh, accurate information our job would be and still is actually because WikiLeaks have not revealed all the information that we need but most of them or a significant proportion of them but our task would be to figure out what, which, uh, what would be the situation uh, exactly. So this is an important situation which revealed something very, very important because some of you may, might have even criticized me for some reason and I would understand it, paying so much attention to Iran's nuclear program. And I try to explain each time as to why I'm using this as a template because in each part, even though this is a PowerPoint in each part, we make references to Iran's situation, of course, Iran's uh, perspective, Iran's position as a country, but we also pay attention to Russia's, U.S., Europeans, uh, and other countries. So, therefore, as these leaks or WikiLeaks have revealed uh, to the world that, uh, and this is something that was just yesterday asked to Mahmoud Abbas, the uh, president, Palestinian president, during his official visit to Ankara, that uh, it was so understood uh, from the uh, WikiLeaks that the Arab leaders who used to uh, be known with their antagonism to Israel, they, with their uh, hostility to Israel, actually were not as much hostile as they used to be in the past, but their primary concern was not the situation of the uh, Palestinians, but that of Iran's nuclear program. So, this is something, I mean, almost uh, overriding everything. And wherever you go, you go to Lisbon Summit, for instance, uh, one of the most important topics was whether the missile defense uh, would be adopted, and if so, under what conditions, and one of uh, the conditions uh, being the condition that was put forward by Turkey, that Iran's name or any country's name would not had not uh, or should not be uh, mentioned in the, in the whatever decision or text uh, that will be adopted. Or you go to this uh, nuclear security summit, for instance, back in April, which was uh, co uh, convened by or, uh, uh, the United States in Washington, D.C. on April 12th, 13th of April. And again, one of the most important topics was Iran Iran's nuclear program and as to how to, how to handle it. And now you I mean, just watch the uh, news channels and the first or second uh, most important news broadcast is about the talks that have started just yesterday in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, about what to do with respect to Iran's nuclear program between Iran and the so-called P5 plus one the permanent members of the United Nations Security Council plus Germany. So therefore this topic is important. It has many facets. It is not just about what Iran is doing, what Iran has done in the past, what are the Iranian ambitions, but you know, it, it's all about what others are doing, uh, are likely to do in the future if things go in a certain direction or in the other direction. And there are also uh, subjects <coughs> Uh, with respect to uh, different proposals, one of them being, as I uh, sort of uh, pro highlighted here for you, for instance, for those, I mean, I had made this an attachment, it's now av available on my website. This is something which has just came out uh, November, December, I mean, right this month, uh, November, December 2010, uh, 2010, and it is one of the four or five articles which were invited by the editor editor of the journal to discuss what or how to move forward. So you see the world stuck in the uh, Iranian nuclear question. It is not something that is going to go anywhere in the uh, foreseeable future and something that is going to tackle our minds. And of course I cannot speak uh, about its content but uh, it, that was also maybe if, uh, the most single most maybe important topic during a very high level discussion conference or round table that I attended over the past weekend, so in England. So therefore this is something that we have to stick to. I mean, not just to look what Iran is doing, what 
they have done in the past or they are going to do in the future, but it is important to see what kind of international security environment we, we have at the moment and what kind of uh, consequences this uh, issue, the nuclear program of Iran, might have for the Middle East as well as for the wider region and the entire globe. Because uh, it is not something that has only one or two consequences for one or two countries. It's something that is uh, on, indeed uh, overarching, that has overarching consequences, implications. So far we have discussed uh, how this issue came out, what was Iran's initial attempts, uh, attempt to, what were these attempts, how they have managed to build the infrastructure during the Shah period, and what kind of difficulties they faced when there was this Islamic revolution, and what were the uh, initiatives taken by the Iranians to overcome the obstacles in advancing uh, their nuclear program, and we have come to the point where they have you know, uh, established significant infrastructure, both technical and scientific, and uh, actually that was a consequence or a result, indeed, of Iran's agreement or the contract that was signed between Iran and Russia back in 1995, and uh, in order to complete the uh, facilities that uh, Germans and French, actually German, uh, Germans in Bush here, uh, left unfinished. So then we have seen, uh, especially after 9-11, 2001, uh, when the world attention actually, uh, especially primarily the United States attention was again fixated on the Middle East. Then came these revelations about Iran's secret uh, construction, clandestine uh, facility in Natanz, the enrichment facility. I talk about the significance of enrichment uh, and, and repossessing that Iran actually has Yes, uh, its reprocessing capabilities are at the laboratory scale, not, not so significant, but still something that can be further advanced, provided that they have enough um, scientific skills, which I believe they have, and also investment. So uh, it, it seems like they will be uh, content with, I mean, happy with the existing situation in terms of uh, the enrichment capabilities that they have. Probably they don't want to create additional problems by investing in large scales in reprocessing of plutonium. So Natanz facility and a couple of uh, other facilities in some of which were already unearthed. I mean, Kum, for instance, the, the, the secret enrichment facility in Kum came out as a result of the uh, uh, spying activities of intelligence uh, agencies of the United States and, and Western European countries. So. Therefore, we have looked at this situation, and the United States has a certain position. It, it has an, uh, an adamant opposition to Iran's nuclear program, and the United States wants Iran to quit its enrichment, although this is something, provided that Iran doesn't have any uh, military ambitions, it is actually within the confines of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So enrichment as well as reprocessing are Iran's right. Uh, stemming from the MPT, the text of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. But of course, there is one condition attached, which is a very important condition, and it is very difficult to see if Iran actually fulfills the, this condition, which is not to divert from peaceful to military. So the whole debate is uh, there. I mean, whether Iran is actually doing things that are proscribed, that are prevented, that are uh, uh, not allowed in the MPT text, or whether, whether Iran, as they claim to uh, be doing, is not doing anything wrong. And it, they only, uh, Iranians only uh, entertain their treaty rights. This is something which is still in the air. There is only one way to uh, have an almost exact, accurate estimate about whether Iran does really do anything wrong or not is to dispatch the IAEA inspectors to that country, let them go to every single facility that the IAEA inspectors would like to go, take samples from uh, the air, from, from the uh, water, from, from the soil, and make all these analyses, and then we can come to a conclusion 
the world can come to a conclusion where Iran is really doing anything wrong. But the only way to do, it, to do this is, of course, for the IAEA uh, to have the uh, permission to go to the uh, facilities that they would like to go. But for this to happen, of course, IAEA must be able uh, to use the uh, rights that are, that are granted to the agency by the additional protocol. This additional protocol was signed, but not ratified by, the, by Iran. It was um, adopted as if the additional protocol were in force for a very short period of time, starting from November 2003 until, I would say, early 2005. I believe uh, it was something like two, March 2005. Within this period, the IAEA had this ability to go to Iran's suspected facilities. Well, not exactly as if additional protocol were enforced, but almost Iranians have allowed the inspectors to go visit wherever they would like to visit because they said we have nothing to hide, we are transparent. Although it is not our obligation because Iran's uh, facilities are being inspected, the safeguards agreement is based on the uh, previous model protocol. And this is, let me tell you, a very good final exam question. What are the differences between model protocol and addition protocol? Why, why is it this important? Why, why this is important? Uh, and I explain, uh, if you want further explanation, I would suggest you to watch the podcast because I'm not going to go into that much detail here. But Iran is subject to model protocol. It is something that is required. It is an obligation under the MPT. But Iran is not subject to additional protocol because it has only signed it, not ratified yet. So therefore, for ex with the exception of this very short period, Iran did not uh, uh, sort of let the IAEA carry out inspections according to additional protocol. And so for the time being, Iran's uh, obligations to open its nuclear facilities uh, stem from the model protocol, which is more restrictive, much weaker, and which involves some loopholes and shortcomings. So therefore, this is something that doesn't provide neither myself as a scholar who tries to be impartial in this issue because I am personally cons concerned about whether Iran is going to build nuclear weapons, which is something that I really suspect. But of course, without having tangible evidence, substantial uh, substanti uh, substantiated evidence, it is po not possible to say the final word, although I have strong suspicions about Iran's ambitions as well as capabilities. But the whole world must make sure that Iran does not, as they claim to be, uh, does not um, uh, divert any of its uh, sort of capabilities from meter or does have no intention to do so in diverting uh, capabilities from peaceful to military application. So this is the whole issue. Uh, and this is something that has many facets. As I said, Iran is one of the actors for sure. It is at the very core. The United States is definitely a, 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 an important actor here. And also uh, the EU, the European Union, not only because it is a collection of uh, highly advanced economically well off, not these days, but you know, still comparatively speaking, Europe is one of the richest zones in the world. I mean, it's a collection of powerful countries, European Union. Well, at the beginning of the 1990s, throughout the 1990s until 2001, September 11 attacks, which was something that uh, had an impact on their world view, the, the perception of threats. I leave this aside, I'm not going to discuss it, but European Union had aspirations towards becoming one of the global actors, not as a contender to the United States, not to compete with the United States or to become a rival, but something, I mean, militarily, but something that would have bigger voice, louder voice in the making of world politics, because there are basically uh, major differences of opinion in terms of how to address international political issues, how to address the threats. European Union, of course, not every single one of the European Union members think alike. 
I mean, they do not necessarily have the exact same view, each one of them they have, but more or less there is a common denominator which is applicable to all of them. At the uh, uh, common denominator we, we see using diplomacy as a tool of resolving differences, as a tool of um, solving the problems. But the United States, which, is, which used to be even uh, much tougher in this respect, but now under Obama administration, we see a slight difference between the previous administration and this one, but still the United States is far different than the European Union. Although European Union is now getting closer to the US uh, sort of a style or perspective, but still there are differences with, and the US added is diplomacy is actually a waste of time. Diplomacy is something that the weaker part or the guilty part, the, the, the criminal part, so to speak, is using in order to gain time to mobilize more support for itself in the international arena or take some uh, measures, you know, uh, build some shields, uh, uh, things that will make it much harder and difficult for the good guy to beat the uh, bad guy. So in the past, as I said, when the EU3 took the initiative, I mean the, the British, French, and German foreign ministers, uh, I think it was at the end of uh, October 2003 or sometime early uh, November 2003, all three of them have gone to Tehran. They spoke with, they talked with their Iranian counterpart and convinced the Iranian foreign minister, who was, uh, I believe, Harazi. And, um, um, and then the Iranians have suspended enrichment as a gesture of their goodwill. And, uh, and as I said, behaved as if additional protocol which provides IAE with enhanced in, uh, inspection uh, uh, or investigation in the country, then, but that, that has lasted until the uh, end of the term of Hatemi. Uh, and even before, because in, before June 2005 elections, it was obvious because of, I think, uh, uh, there is this uh, obligation or restriction for Iranian presidents not to serve more than two terms. I'm not sure, but I believe that was the reason. And Hatimi was not going to run for presidency. And therefore, by the time the elections in June 2005, EU3 and Iranian negotiations and the suspension of enrichment, all of them were just thrown out of the window. And since then, only until uh, October 2009, just last year, Uh, that the P5 plus one uh, and Iran have started to talk in Geneva, which did not last too, too long. And then came all the other initiatives, including Turkey's swap deal initiative. And just yesterday, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, Iran and P5 plus one have again sit uh, around the table and talk. And on the news I heard, uh, there were constructive talks, which means in our language, they have not agreed upon anything. So this is the diplomatic way of screening the reality. Well, well, we'll probably hear more about in the WikiLeaks next week or maybe later. So therefore, uh, the European Union's position is important. And by looking at it, we will see what, if any, uh, sort of responsibilities uh, the uh, European Union or the European countries had in the past or how they see the situation today recently and at present time and how this may or may not have any impact on the resolution of the conflict. As you will see here and indicate on the screen, uh, the Europeans have encouraged Iran to invest in nuclear technology and provided education training to Iranian students and scientists all throughout the 1960s and 70s. So there are many Iranian students. Today, of course, they are in their probably 50s, 60s uh, with their you know, uh, high academic degrees. They have earned their MA, master's, as well as doctoral degrees in European uh, universities in France and Germany. I think I said that before uh, during one of the meetings that I attended that was back in February 2005 in Berlin in Germany, uh, one of the uh, participants said, I mean, there were hundreds, I mean, this is something that you know, was 
emphasized by the person, there were hundreds of Iranian students who earned their degrees, high, high, higher education degrees, in German universities, in the nuclear field, nuclear physics, engineering, and whatever uh, other related chemistry maybe uh, would be. So this is something that, in some sense, uh, and uh, as I indicated in uh, one of my articles, uh, let me just also show that to you here, for you uh, not to have this difficulty to uh, search for it. Oops. What kind of system is this? All right. Um, yeah, yeah. This is this one. Good for the Shah, uh, not for the mullahs. And there you can see that that I caught some people, of course, with their permission or without uh, naming them because of the lack of permission, as I always observe this thing. So if you go ahead and read this one. You can see how the West, the West being the United States, of course, on the one hand, and uh, European Union or European countries in the past. You can see here, um, oops, yeah, in the, in the later pages, you can see anyway, so I mean, just go ahead and read it. Uh, you will find it very important. Yesterday I received an email from the editor, the editor of the Daily Telegraph. He said, I've been reading your article since 2006. I said, wow, my students, I wish my students were doing the same thing. The, <laughs> the editor of uh, someone, I mean, is one of the world's most important newspapers, and he wanted to call me not only about this, the good for the Shah, uh, not for the Mola's article, but also most recent uh, one, which I just show you how to move forward the built-in of the atomic scientist article. We had about an hour of discussion, interview on the phone, and he was going to make an article out of it, probably with, uh, based on the conversations that he had with other people. So, therefore, information there, uh, I mean, to emphasize, is important. And the <coughs> Europeans, uh, because of this, feel this moral obligation to do something because they say we have, in a sense, uh, in, incited uh, uh, these people. I mean, we, we wanted them to invest more because remember, after this Yom Kippur war, there comes this oil embargo which causes this OPEC crisis increasing uh, uh, the oil prices four times and Iran incurring all these uh, uh, revenues coming from uh, exports of oil, etc., and then embarks on uh, enlarging its nuclear vision and nuclear program and, and putting this ambition forward to have a 20,000 megawatt electric installed within the next 20 years. And 20,000 megawatt electric uh, power plant means something in between 18, 19, or 20 different nuclear reactors, or four or five nuclear power plants, each of which hosting four or five nuclear reactors. So huge ambition. And therefore, uh, have seen, having seen the money in the hands, in the pockets of the Shah, Iran, uh, Europeans wanted to get just grab part of that money by selling them nuclear technology. So they provided all these encouragements to, to Iran to buy their nuclear power reactors. And therefore, French and the German firms have lobbied in, in Iran and finally uh, secured deals, uh, and which, of course, as I've said uh, many, many times, the Germans were building the Boucher reactor, which now is completed by the Russians, based on the 1995 contract. So therefore, there is this moral obligation. And uh, Europeans say, had we not encourage the Iranians that much, maybe we would not have faced this Iranian problem, problem today. So this is uh, something that uh, they, they sort of think about it. As you can see here again, uh, they ceased cooperation with Iran in the 80s under the influence of the US, but resume in the second half of the 1990s by signing trade contracts. Well, I, you will remember uh, that I mentioned Bill Clinton when he came to power in the United States, he became president in 1992, then he imposed this dual containment policy toward Iran and Iraq. Dual containment 
actually aimed at containing uh, Iran and Iraq in order to prevent them from provoking the Middle East peace process. Middle East peace process, uh, which was uh, going on in front of the eyes of the world community in Madrid, but also secretly behind the doors in Oslo. So the US foreign policy objective was to contain Iran and Iraq, which was called dual containment, and the United States imposed actually its own will on its European allies and said, look, if you do trade with Iran and Iraq, they will have earnings, and they will spend these earnings to armament. So if you do not do trade with these countries, you will not have sort of uh, the responsibility for their investment or spending in armament. So Europeans actually, I don't know for what reason, most probably because of uh, displaying this alliance uh, coherence, solidarity, and maybe the United States might have provided some intelligence reports which may have convinced Europeans not to do trade with Iran and Iraq. But as I said again before, uh, it was then uh, made or revealed uh, through some reports that the Iran's second biggest or maybe third biggest trade partners, I mean, as a, as a group, uh, was actually a group of uh, partner companies, parent companies, under the guise of different sort of countries, companies, were indeed American firms, US firms. The United States, while on the one hand, imposing on European states as well as European firms in the 1990s under the dual containment policy not to do trade with Iran and Iraq, but at the same time, American firms under, the, under different names through different parent, parent companies were doing trade with Iran. When this, is, this issue came to the fore, of course, it caused a lot of uh, outbursts in, in Europe. And since then, Europe has lost much of its confidence in the United States. N probably not as much as they lost now after WikiLeaks, but that was something that really prompted the European firms to start doing business. You prevent us from taking advantage of doing business with Iran while your companies, American companies, are doing this under different names through parent companies. This is not acceptable. And then they said, all right, we do business with Iran as well. So uh, as I said uh, just earlier, uh, this uh, uh, also, in a sense, emphasized the deep divergences of views between the United States uh, and the European Union on the ways and means of uh, dealing with international security problems. EU countries prefer economic and diplomatic incentives over coercive policies uh, or use force. You know what? Um, I don't know if you have taken any course on European security defense issues, uh, but there is, of course, this new, I mean, talk for some time, not just now, uh, for so many years already, uh, of a European constitution, because the European Union is making itself into a global actor with, of course, the Commission, which is something like uh, the Council of Ministers. There is this uh, um, higher uh, commissioners for certain issues for health, like uh, uh, ministers uh, uh, for European security and defense issues. In the constitution, Actually, uh, I don't know where it was here or in a, in a conference outside of Turkey, but I had a chance to listen to someone uh, who gave a very detailed expose, provided an expose about the content of the European Constitution. Well, I believe that was uh, a conference at Boston University, which I was there in Tenet. Uh, and after listening to this person for about an hour, I noticed that he did not say anything with respect to uh, the security issues. I mean, foreign policy, fine, but what about security? And, and, and more specifically, about use of force. And I asked that question, isn't there any clause, any sort of a statement, sentence, something that refers to use of force? And if I'm not mistaken, he said, 
there is no single reference in the European Constitution to use of force. Well, of course, Europeans might, must have taken some, uh, uh, some, some uh, measures in order to you know, resort to force if necessary. They will not just sit back and you know, watch the situation just because there is no explicit reference to use of force. But they have avoided uh, deliberately the term of use, use of force in their constitution because it is their belief uh, that use of force is not something that leads anywhere and that economic, diplomatic, political tools, instruments must be resorted to before anything else and the uh, crisis must be contained, etc., etc. So there is therefore a whole you know, uh, a new different attitude when compared to the history of uh, Europe. And this is actually the creation of the European Union, as you know, the European integration was based on the lessons learned from past tragedies. But still the United States is uh, uh, making uh, use of force as one of the main pillars of its foreign policy, foreign and security policy. So therefore, there is this huge gap in terms of how to handle the problematic issues, uh, crisis situation, and how, what kind of methods and uh, sort of tools to use them. So therefore, uh, before going on any further with Russia, just let me stick to the uh, present situation of the European Union. Indeed, as I uh, uh, also explain in, in, in parts, for instance, uh, let me just go back to this before the break. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, this one. At some point, I make uh, a quotation from a 2005 or 2006 uh, piece uh, written by a European analyst. Let me just try to find it here. In which, yeah, here we go. You see, I believe you can see. This is uh, a quotation from, yeah, 2005. The EU3 argued that Iran cannot be trusted to control the whole nuclear fuel cycle, even under international supervision. They fear that technology developed under the under pilot scheme could be used in a secret military project, and they argued that Iran's history of pursuing a covert program of, for, for, for 18 years means that it cannot be given the benefit of doubt. Therefore, the only way Iran could provide a satisfactory guarantee would be to announce a permanent end to all uranium enrichment activities to be verified by international inspections. So this is actually written in 2005, most possibly after the ending of the, this initiative that was taken by the EU3 between November 2003 and more or less March, maybe earlier, maybe a little later, uh, 2005. And the, the, uh, the picture that the Europeans got out of all this uh, experience, uh, I mean, it's a, a year and a half, intensive sort of negotiations with Iranians, they have concluded that Iran could not be trusted. But still, it is important to bear this in mind. This being the case, which is uh, cited, uh, sort of quoted here, and uh, let's go to the end and see uh, the source here. For your information, it's available. Here it is. Can EU diplomacy stop Iran's nuclear program? Working paper, Center for European Reform, November 2005. So that was after the uh, sort of stop. And that was just after Ahmadinejad came to power. And it was pretty much th that time, I mean, maybe uh, September, October 2005, that he made this statement about Zionism, that Zionism must be swept out of the face of the earth. So that has created a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, uproar in the European circles because there are many Jews, Jewish Europeans or European Jewish uh, citizens in many European countries. So therefore, uh, and Israelis, uh, I believe, I remember, were telling me, well, Ahmadinejad is actually our president because he couldn't, uh, even our president couldn't make such a big favor to us because we were having trouble in expl explaining to the Europeans that Iran uh, was deceiving them, was lying to them, but they were not believing in us. So with these statements uh, Ahmadinejad made about Israel and Zionism, etc., and that he didn't believe in the Holocaust, everything, the Europeans got really furious. 
and then they change, uh, or the start of the change of attitude uh, was that, at, at that point. So therefore, it is important to bear in mind that the Europeans, even though they uh, kept their major differences with respect to international uh, events, maybe with the specific reference to the Iranian situation, they tend to get closer in terms of worldview to Iranian, uh, to, uh, to U.S. attitude toward Iran. So this is therefore uh, an important issue to bear in mind. And that yet this should not uh, suggest, one, that e European Union has put aside altogether all of its uh, differences with the United States and that now they are you know, bandwagoning with the United States and Israel to do anything militarily. No, this is not the situation. The United States may or may not have plans to attack Iran nuclear facilities with, uh, together with Israel or all, just all alone, or maybe Israel might have such policies or considerations. But even though European Union countries as a whole and individually, especially France and, and, and United Kingdom, at the United Nations Security Council as the permanent members have emphasized uh, that Iran must do this and that, but they will most likely refrain from doing anything militarily or taking any part in, the, in any kind of military attack or a, a sort of operation against Iran. So even though they, they get closer uh, to the U U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis their political stance, or diplomatic stance, this should not suggest that European position is getting closer to the United States in terms of military, uh, possible military sort of uh, contingencies vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Iran. So uh, having said that, let's give a break. And after the break, we'll continue with the position of other countries. <laughs>